Initially released in 2012, Hotline Miami is a top-down action game inspired by the decadence of 1980s Miami. Its story often blurs the line between dream and reality, calling into question the validity of what's happening, giving it an atmosphere of intrigue and mystery. It was followed up by a sequel released in 2015, which compounded the mysteries of the first game by telling its story out of chronological order. However, sifting through and reordering everything the series has to offer should help unravel the mystery of the games and clarify the full picture. Let's go ahead and do just that. And I don't think I need to mention it, but there are spoilers for the stories of Hotline Miami and Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number in this video. You should really play the games and experience their awesome stories the way they were meant to be experienced before watching this video. Also, the storytelling in this video for some of the characters will be a little awkward due to the rearranging of events. If you would like to have a more focused telling of a particular character's story, feel free to check the other videos in the Hala Miami playlist on the channel. But with that out of the way, let's get started. The series opens in a bar in Hawaii in 1985. Here is the introduction of four characters, Barnes, Daniels, Beard, and Ever Silent, Jacket. These characters are soldiers in an elite special forces unit called the Ghost Wolves in the US military, which is in the middle of a war with the Soviet Union. During the war, the Soviet Union has managed to invade the Hawaiian Islands, and these soldiers are here to defend US territory. But right now, they're just enjoying themselves while catching a drink. Beard mentions he's going to head back to camp, and Jackie goes with him. When they exit the bar, a war correspondent named Evan Wright approaches them, asking him if he can take their picture for his story. Beard agrees, and asks if a copy could be sent to his home address, but the correspondent says they have a Polaroid, so he can get Beard a copy immediately. The duo stand in the sun, and Beard puts his arm around Jacket while Jacket flashes a peace sign. Beard grabs his photo, and the duo hop in the back of a truck and head back to camp. That night, Beard meets with his commanding officer, a man known as the Colonel, who sends the wolves on a mission to ambush the Soviet camp. Beard decimates the Soviets, and when finished, calls the rest of the unit over the radio. The coded dialogue between the wolves is used to hide their transmissions from the Soviets, and was a protocol handed down by the Colonel. Beard finds the rest of the unit has captured some prisoners, and Daniels has found some intel in the hut of the Soviet commander. After dealing with the prisoners, they return to camp. Six months later, in October of 1985, the wolves are gathered on a beach. Still mired in the war, Beard, Barnes, and Daniels contemplate their futures, while Jacket sunbathes nearby. Barnes says he'd like to open a bar, which Daniels mocks him for. When Barnes asks what Daniels is going to do, Daniels says he was a teacher, and that's what he intends to return to after the war. Barnes asks Beard, who says he would be happy with anything that doesn't involve killing people. He imagines working in a convenience store, sitting comfortably with a little TV close by. Beard then says he tries not to think too much about it, because things never turn out the way you expect them to. He says he's going to go check on the Colonel, since they were supposed to receive their mission hours ago. Beard finds the Colonel alone in his hut, celebrating a recent promotion. But when he laments that America will likely lose this war, Beard knows he isn't as happy as he seems. The Colonel lightens the mood by telling Beard that he and the rest of the Wolves will likely be heading home soon, but have one final mission to complete before that. They're tasked with charging an enemy camp entirely on their own. The Colonel tells Beard not to get himself killed and sends him off. Although the mission is harrowing, the Wolves succeed in capturing the Soviet stronghold. Beard meets with the commander of D Company, who, impressed by the Wolves, wishes his own men were trained as well as them, mentioning they've been trying to capture this base for weeks, but have suffered heavy casualties. He tells Beard to set up camp and rest, and he'll gather his men to join them shortly. Later, Beard tells the others they've completed their last mission, and Barnes wants to celebrate by finding some alcohol. But due to the state of the roads, Daniel recommends they keep their wits about them until D Company shows up. Barnes disagrees, saying D Company is inadequate, and the wolves don't need them. But Beard agrees with Daniels, saying there's safety in numbers. He says he's gonna go lie down and ask to be woken up when the Colonel arrives. When the Colonel does arrive, he has some bad news. Command has one more mission for the Ghost Wolves. Nearby is a heavily guarded Soviet power plant helping fuel the Soviet war effort. The Ghost Wolves are tasked with capturing the Soviet power plant completely on their own. 
It's a suicide mission. The night before their mission, the wolves are sitting together in their bunker, wondering why they've been given this mission. Angrily, Barnes thinks Command is trying to get them killed, and uncharacteristically, Daniels agrees with him. Barnes says a whole platoon should be sent to capture the power plant, and Beard guesses the power plant is too risky for a whole platoon because it's likely the whole place is booby-trapped. He pauses, then concludes the wolves are more expendable. There's a sudden crack of lightning, and the colonel walks in from the rain, raising his blood-soaked hands to the sky. He asks his soldiers if they can see it, if they can see his face. After all, it's his true nature. The colonel is wearing the skinned face of a panther with a strange symbol carved into it, a circle with three lines through it. He continues his mad rant, saying they are all a bunch of animals. The soldiers are sent to kill or be killed, blindly following orders while never questioning why. All because deep down inside, they love it. Violence and destruction. It's all just a part of their nature. Sheepishly, Beard asks the colonel if he's okay. The panther face slides off and the blood-soaked colonel stammers that he's had too much to drink. He says he's going to go lie down, and Beard says that's a good idea. As he leaves, Barnes wonders what kinds of things the colonel's been drinking. Anxiety hangs heavy on the air the following morning as the wolves gather for their mission. Beard meets with the colonel, who isn't feeling very good sending his men into a death trap, but can't do anything to stop it. He says he's got word that the wolves will be sent home, but fears they'll be sent home in body bags. He tells Beard that no matter what happens, it's been damn good commanding the unit and says he couldn't be prouder of them. He wishes him good luck and Beard sets off into the jungle. Barnes looses a grate to the power plant and Beard begins a long, arduous fight through the power plant. Incredibly, he makes it through and when he reaches the Soviet general's office, finds that Barnes, Daniels, and Jacket have all made it alive. Inside the office, the Russian general has killed all the engineers, and the wolves arrive in time to see him kill himself. But he put the power plant in meltdown before doing so. With a siren blaring, Barnes and Jacket rush to a nearby elevator which suddenly blows up, blowing Barnes in half and fatally injuring Jacket. Daniels rushes to Barnes, who is still alive, and Beard rushes to Jacket. He picks him up and quickly jumps into another elevator nearby, leaving Barnes and Daniels behind. He navigates through an underground network of tunnels and escapes before the power plant detonates. Outside, he frantically calls a Casavac, throwing Protocol out the window and giving his exact location. He tells Jacket to hang on, and Jacket stretches his hand out as a gesture of gratitude. Beard tells him there's no need to thank him, saying, it's on the house. So Jacket doesn't forget who saved him. Beard gives him the picture of the two taken months ago by the reporter. Clutching the memento in his hands, Jacket survives his injuries. Shortly afterward, the two are discharged from the military and return home, Jacket to Miami and Beard to San Francisco. They make their transition to civilian life and Beard manages to get a relaxing job at the convenience store, just like he said he wanted on the beach. The two maintain their friendship through frequent phone calls, and it's during one of these calls on April 3, 1986, that we next see Beard where he's consoling Jacket through a recent breakup. Beard then asks Jacket about the photo from Hawaii and wonders if Jacket ever sent him a copy. Jacket hasn't gotten around to it yet and Beard asks him to send one when he gets a chance. He tells Jacket that something's going on outside his store and he'll talk to him later. Hanging up the phone, Beard walks out of his door and a bright white light fills the entire screen wiping everything away. This was an explosion from a nuclear bomb dropped by the Soviet Union. It struck San Francisco and killed thousands of innocent people. As a result of this strike, the Russo-American War is ended, and a coalition called the Russo-American Coalition is created between the two nations to prevent another tragedy such as San Francisco from happening again and to maintain peace. In addition to this cooperation between the country that destroyed San Francisco, a large influx of Russian immigrants flow into the U.S. and settle in its cities, upsetting U.S. citizens. As a result, anti-Russian sentiments begin rising. 
patriotic organizations are created to help resist the Russian influence and maintain American pride. It's during this period that members of the Russian Mafia, led by a man nicknamed Father, move into Miami. In their trademark white suits, the Russian Mafia carves out territory in the criminal underground of Miami using weaponry gained from the Soviet military. They begin a drug trade and even manage to coerce US politicians to cooperate with them. Very shortly, the Russian Mafia has a criminal monopoly in Miami, raising anti-Russian sentiments even further. Eventually, someone resolves to do something about it. We fast forward to 1989 in Miami, where we meet two new characters named Richter and his mother, Rosa. Rosa has been afflicted with an unnamed disease that restricts her movement, and Richter lives with her to take care of her and help her around the house. Although Rosa feels guilty that Richter is sacrificing his personal life to take care of her, Richter is happy to help his mother out. In March of 1989, Richter begins receiving strange phone calls that ask him to do weird things, like leave cryptic messages at other numbers, or paint a symbol, a circle with three lines through it at certain locations. The same symbol carved into the face of the skinned panther by the colonel. Additionally, these phone calls feel similar to the coded messages used by the ghost wolves in Hawaii. He ignores the messages, but then they start getting threatening. On April 2nd, 1989, he wakes up to find his car had been torched in the night. On his phone is another message, and this time, it threatens his mother by name. Richter heads upstairs to check on his mother and is relieved to find her okay lying on her bed. Rosa tells him about a strange dream she had. Richter was sitting on an island with his father, staring out to the sea. It was peaceful, but Rosa says something bad was about to happen. She can't remember what, then guesses it wasn't so bad after all. In order to protect his mother, Richter decides to comply with the phone message and tells her he has to leave for a bit. He'll make her something to eat when he comes back, and Rosa simply says that she'll take a nap until then. Richter takes a bus to the address left on his answering machine to find it's a bar that's flying Soviet flags. Inside are men in white suits. Wearing a rubber rat mask to protect his identity, Richter kills all of the people inside. He quickly flees the scene and returns home where he finds his mother got out of bed to make herself something to eat. Richter shows concern, but Rosa quashes that concern, saying she's still got some fight left in her. Richter hopes his nightmare is over, but his phone call is not an isolated incident. Instead, it's only the first in what will become an epidemic. The very next day on April 3rd, 1989, three years to the day of the bombing of San Francisco, another phone call is placed. However, this one isn't placed to Richter, but instead to Jacket, the surviving member of the Ghost Wolves from Hawaii. His message mentions that cookies have been delivered to his door, but the box outside doesn't contain any cookies. Instead, there's a rubber rooster mask and a note ordering him to obtain a briefcase. Ominously, the note says failure isn't an option and that they will be watching. Jacket makes his way to the metro to find a man with a briefcase, but he's being guarded by men in white suits. Upon seeing Jacket, the men attack him, but Jacket fights off his attackers, killing them, and for some reason, feels satisfied by their murders. Retrieving the briefcase, Jacket leaves and throws it in a dumpster. A hobo then appears upset that someone is in his alley. Jacket deals with them the same way he's dealt with the other men, killing him by smashing his head into the ground. However, this time, the murder leaves Jacket feeling sick, and he throws up on the pavement. He quickly flees the scene and returns home to his apartment. A few days later, on April 8th, after reading the pamphlet of a patriotic organization named 50 Blessings, Jacket finds another message on his answering machine. Remembering the warning from the note, Jacket complies with his task. This time, before entering the building, he notices a symbol painted outside on the doorstep, a circle with three lines through it, the same symbol Richter was tasked with painting. Inside, Jacket finds men in white suits occupy it. He again kills all of these men and leaves when finished. On April 10th, Richter tells his mother that he's going out. Rosa is disappointed since she was hoping Richter could help her take a bath. Richter says he'll help as soon as he comes back. 
Rosa thinks Richter is going for a job interview and sends him on his way, telling him that she can take care of herself. In actuality, Richter received another phone message and he's going out to complete his mission. Richter finds the address as a building that's in disuse and inside finds men in white suits. He kills all of them and after the chaos has settled, notices places where the floorboards have been torn up. Underneath lie boxes of military grade weaponry. These are the same type of weapons used by the Russian Mafia in their criminal activities. Richter wonders if there's some connection between the calls and the Russian Mafia, but concerned with the well-being of his mother, he quickly heads back home. When he returns, he finds Rosa unconscious on the bathroom floor. He carries her to her bed, where she regains consciousness soon after Richter lies her down. She tells him that she was going to take a bath on her own, but passed out. Richter wants to call the doctor, but Rosa tells him not to worry, that she'll be good as new once she gets some rest. About a week later on April 16th, we return to Jacket to see he started collecting newspaper scraps about his murders. This one mentions that the police suspect the murders on the 8th had to do with the illegal drug trade in Miami. The Russian Mafia is heavily involved in the drug trade of Miami, which furthers the speculation that the Russian Mafia and the phone calls are related. Jacket finds a new message on his answering machine. And during his mission, he finds the men in white have been torturing a man tied up to a chair. Strangely, the man is wearing a rubber walrus mask. Jacket and Richter aren't the only ones being sent on these missions. Another week passes and on April 23rd, Richter goes to tell Rosa he's headed out again. But this time, she asks him if he would tell her if he got into any kind of trouble. Richter lies to her, assuring her that he's only going to meet with a friend. Rosa is happy to hear that and asks if Richter could invite his friend over sometime. Richter simply replies, yeah, maybe. He leaves and again fulfills his mission, killing the men at the address given by the message. Two days later on April 25th, Jacket has settled into a routine. Newspaper clipping, phone message, and murder. This time, after he kills everyone at the building, he finds a woman lying on a bed. The woman is half naked with cameras pointed to her. On the bed next to her are a pair of handcuffs and a syringe. With tears streaking down her face, she tells Jacket to finish her, implying something malicious happened in this room, pushing her to want death. Jacket stands over her, picks her up, and carries her to his car. The same day, a man in his bathroom shaves his head in the sink. This man is named Jake, and after admiring his work, he exits to his small, messy apartment. The pamphlet to a patriotic organization named 50 Blessings lying on his counter implies he is a patriot, but the Confederate flag lying on his couch implies his patriotism may be more sinister than believed. Jake finds a message on his answering machine and checks it to hear a message similar to the ones that Richter and Jacket have been receiving. But unlike them, he interrupts the caller, demanding to talk to their boss. It seems this isn't the first call he's received. The caller ignores his pleas and hangs up when finished, much to Jake's annoyance. Although disgusted at the disrespect to Shonem, Jake heads to the address given to him to find his news station. He puts on a rubber snake mask and charges in, finding men in white suits throughout the station, and like Richter and Jacket, kills all of them. On the top floor, he finds one of the men talking with the editor of the station. Jake charges in and kills both of them. On the desk in front of him is a case full of cash. As payment for his job, Jake takes the money and leaves the station. He wants to celebrate his newfound wealth, so he heads to a local tattoo shop where he asks to get a tattoo on his shoulder. The clerk offers him a slot for next Friday. But Jake says he wants to get tattooed today since he's celebrating a special occasion. The man apologizes, telling him that they're booked for days, so Jake storms out in anger, calling the man a Russian asshole, revealing his prejudiced nature. We now enter the month of May to find Jacket in his apartment. However, he's not alone anymore. The girl he rescued from his last mission is sleeping on the couch. He didn't kill her, but instead rescued her bringing her to his apartment to rest and recuperate. He lets her sleep and checks his phone message for a new mission. This time, when he's clearing the building, 
He finds a man in a rubber tiger mask tied up in a chair being interrogated by the men in white. The interrogators have wired the man with explosives, so if he tries to escape the room, he'll blow up. However, the interrogators didn't anticipate someone else would be coming into the room, so when Jacket shoots open the door to the room, the explosives detonate, killing the man and his interrogators. The bomb blast rang throughout the entire city, so Jacket quickly leaves the scene. On May 11th, Jacket is seen reading the newspaper about his last murder. Over the past few days, the girl has been living with Jacket and is now locked inside the bathroom. Jacket leaves her alone and finds he has another message. He completes this mission, but after clearing the building, hears moans coming from a sewer close by. He opens the manhole and heads down to see a man sitting in a pool of his own blood. Nearby lies a rubber crocodile mask. Wide-eyed, the man is seemingly in denial of his own fate, and Jacket hears his frantic attempts to rationalize everything as just a dream. The refusal of his fate doesn't impede his coming death, and he soon succumbs to his wounds. Two days pass, and we return to Jacket's apartment to see the girl happily lounging in the bath. Today, the newspaper clipping reveals the press have noticed the string of murders performed by masked assailants and notes that the victims have connections to the Russian Mafia, confirming the suspicion that the Russian Mafia are the targets of these messages. Despite this, the police are denying rumors of a vigilante movement. Curiously, Jacket finds a new message for him on his answering machine. There are usually a lot more days in between his missions. When he answers, the caller mentions that someone went home sick, possibly explaining the quick turnaround in Jacket's missions. The mission this time involves some VIP guests at Hotel Blue. When Jacket arrives at the hotel, he notices the men in white, the Russian gangsters, are meeting with and guarding men in black suits. Jacket puts on his mask, picks up a gun, and kills everyone, including the men in black suits, only sparing a janitor cleaning one of the rooms, one that looks similar to the one cleaning his apartment building. The same day, we're brought to a local bar where a man with a biker helmet is shaking a man wearing a rubber pig mask. It seems like he found a mass murderer and is attacking him, but it's revealed he's an accomplice of the mass murderers, and he's telling the man that he's bored, he wants out, and the man wearing the pig mask is going to tell him how. Now it's interesting to note that this man is trying to quit, and Jackie got a call earlier in the day about someone calling in sick. Biker throws the man to the floor and the man relents, telling him about a man at a Chinese restaurant that knows more. Biker heads to the Chinese restaurant and in a small dark room in the back, finds a man in front of some computers. Biker grabs a man's collar and threatens him to get answers. The man quickly gives up information, saying he doesn't know who's behind everything, but he helped set up the system at phone home to sweep their calls, and Biker will have to hack the system to trace them. He mentions the people terrified him because they seem to have a political agenda, so he went into hiding after setting up the system. Biker, satisfied with the information he was given, releases the man and leaves, resolving to find the source of the calls. A few days later on May 16th, we find Biker in his apartment. With decorative rugs, colorful sheets and electrical equipment, it's a lot different from Jacket's plain apartment. Lying on the table in front of the couch is something we've seen before a pamphlet for an organization named 50 Blessings. Biker also has a message on his answering machine, and the message says the client will not tolerate further delays, implying Biker has been abandoning previous missions. To buy more time for his investigation, he completes his mission, killing Russian gangsters at a local arcade. On May 23rd, while the girl is relaxing on the couch, Jacket is reading the newspaper clippings about his last job. The clipping reveals that several victims had connections to a criminal network, likely the Russian Mafia, and included among those killed were three politicians involved with the Russo-American coalition. Jacket wonders what kind of connections there could be with the coalition and the Russian Mafia, but his thoughts are interrupted by a call on his phone. He's tasked with clearing out condos and climbs a building killing everyone on each floor. The same night, Biker had a drug-fueled party in his apartment. In its aftermath, he finds a message on his answering machine. Deciding he's had enough, 
He heads to the phone home building to find the source of the calls. He bursts into the manager's office, killing the man to get to his computer. He hacks into their system and finds the true source of the calls. Then, the doors to the office open and Jacket walks in the room. After completing his mission, he received a call in the building he just cleared. It was the callers, and they told him to head to phone home to deal with a prank caller. The callers found out Biker abandoned his mission and was hacking into their equipment to find him, so they sent Jacket to stop him. After a tense standoff, Jacket and Biker engage in a brutal fight. The very next day, we see Biker in his apartment, meaning he emerged from the fight alive. He's got a new message on his phone that doubles as a threat from the callers, but Biker doesn't feel threatened and makes his way to the address he found in the phone home computer. He enters the building and sees a janitor quickly flee. He gives chase and finds a secret hideout in the sewers below the building where the janitors have numerous phones set up and have boxes of animal masks, confirming they're the source of the calls. Biker confronts the janitors and begins asking questions. Then the janitors realize he doesn't know anything, so they toy with him, saying it was all a game they did for fun. Biker begins to leave, but before doing so, notices a computer in the janitor's workshop. It's password protected, but by using his biker intuition, he successfully guesses the password, gets into their computer, and discovers the janitor's plan. He confronts the janitors again, and this time, they freely speak of their plan, revealing they work for a patriotic organization named 50 Blessings, the same one that Biker, Jacket, and Jake are all members of, and they're using their members to carry out assassination contracts. Their ultimate goal is to topple the Russo-American coalition and remake the country in their image. They vaguely hint at powerful friends they have on their side. This could possibly be the Colonel from Hawaii. After all, 50 Blessings uses a circle with three lines through it as a symbol, the same one the Colonel carved into the skinned panther face during his crazed rant. Biker cuts them off, saying they've wasted enough of his time. He leaves them to their schemes, gets on his bike, and sets out. He realizes he can't return home, as he now faces the entirety of the 50 Blessings organization, so he flees Miami in order to plan his next move. But out in the wilds of America, he has an encounter that completely changes him. On May 27th, we find Jack had also made it out of the phone home building, returning to his apartment beat up, but alive. The girl is still living with him, and now her presence begins to be felt. The apartment is much cleaner, all the garbage and newspaper clippings are gone, and now she stays in the bedroom with Jacket, although in a separate bed. However, Jacket still receives phone messages asking for his services. After Biker visited the janitors, they realized Jacket failed to kill him, and they now had a loose thread in Jacket that needed to be dealt with. They decided to reduce the time spent in between his missions and send him on incredibly dangerous ones in an attempt to get him killed. They begin by sending him to a dance club where another operative was killed shortly after entering the building, but Jacket easily handles the gangsters in the club, killing all of them. On the closing day of May, Jacket is alone in his apartment when 50 Blessings sends him to attack a drug den of the Russian Mafia. He's easily killing gangsters when a police raid is suddenly started on the building he's attacking. Although the police manage to arrest the gangsters and capture the drugs, Jacket slips through their fingers and narrowly escapes the police. Three days later, to 50 Blessings' dismay, Another issue arises that could destroy their whole operation. During the evening, we find Jake in his apartment, where he's given a new mission. This time, instead of interrupting the caller, he happily accepts his mission. He sets out, but before heading to the address given, he stops by the 50 Blessings headquarters and catches the manager just before they close. He tells the manager about a plan he's thought of and begins explaining about the calls he's been getting, hinting at consequences if you don't comply with them. The manager is immediately defensive, but Jake goes on, suggesting to the manager that 50 Blessings set up a similar operation since they have the resources and most of their members are trained veterans, but primarily target Russians, start a civil movement, and help free America of its oppressors. 
Jake is inadvertently pitching 50 Blessing's own plan to themselves. And the manager defends 50 Blessing, saying it's a peaceful organization that wouldn't force anyone to do anything they don't want to, and innocently wonders what Jake's accusing them of. Jake begins to explain that he's not accusing them of anything, but the manager's tense silence leads him to realize the truth. 50 Blessings are the ones behind the calls. He happily soaks in his revelation, and the manager abruptly tells Jake to leave. Thinking the man can't talk about it here, Jake agrees to leave, mentioning he has something important to do. 50 Blessings now has another loose thread, and since Jake knows the full truth, it's important he be dealt with as soon as possible. Luckily for them, while Jake is out completing his mission, his rampage is stopped by the Russians. His unconscious body is dragged to a bathhouse, where he is tortured for information. He endures the torture, and never reveals his secret knowledge of 50 blessings. The gangster points a gun at him and gives him an opportunity for last words. In a final act of defiance, Jake spits at his captors before a bullet is fired into his head. After Jake's abduction, 50 blessings placed a call to Jacket to attack the immense bathhouse Jake was taken to in an effort to kill two birds with one stone. However, Jacket successfully clears the building and even finds Jake's corpse in one of the rooms. While one threat has been dealt with, 50 Blessings still has to deal with Jacket. Five days later, we return to Jacket's apartment to see the reappearance of the girl, indicating she's staying of her own volition. The beds in the bedroom have now been pushed together, implying something deeper has developed between Jacket and the girl. The phone messages have continued, and this mission seems pretty tame in comparison to Jacket's recent missions. As he goes to leave, however, a black van crashes through the front doors, and gangsters start piling out of it, ambushing Jacket. However, Jacket even survives this, killing all the gangsters and burning the body of the driver. 50 Blessings thus decides to take a more direct approach in their Jacket dilemma. They call one of their other operatives and order him to break into Jacket's apartment and kill him. Richter busts open the door to the apartment, but only finds the girl, whom he quickly guns down in the bathroom. He waits for Jacket, who eventually comes home and finds the girl dead. He rushes into the living room to find Richter sitting on his couch. After a short conversation, Richter guns Jacket down, seemingly killing him. However, Richter only injured Jacket, and he's taken to a hospital where he has surgery to survive his injuries. The stress puts Jacket into a coma, and he forgets all that's happened to him over the past few months. Over the passing weeks, he begins dreaming during his coma. He dreams of his lost friend Beard, of the girl he rescued. He dreams of the things he's done and those he's hurt, and dreams of people in masks. A woman dressed like the girl wearing a donkey mask, a man dressed like a Russian mobster wearing an owl mask, and a man dressed like him wearing a rooster mask. Through cryptic dialogue, they guide Jacket through his memories, and after the attack by Richter, Jacket is confronted by the man in the rooster mask. The man tells Jacket that things won't end well for him, and he's going to end up all alone. He tells Jacket a secret, saying anything he does from now on will be pointless, that he'll never understand what's happened to him or why and it's all his own fault. He offers no more answers, but tells Jacket to head for a warm bed across the hall. Jacket makes his way across the hall while Static changes his clothes into a hospital gown. He enters the room to find the bed is a hospital bed and find himself lying in it. And he finally remembers all that's happened to him and realizes he's dreaming. Jacket also realizes Beard's death at the hands of the Soviet Union hurt him a lot more than he believed. He harbored an anger for Russians after the bombing, and when the phone messages began coming in and he found they targeted Russians, he complied with them because he felt he was getting revenge for the man that saved his life so many years ago. Weeks pass by, and finally, on July 21st, Jacket awakes from his coma. He overhears a police officer and doctor talk about his attack and the death of the girl. The officer then mentions the man that attacked him is locked up at the station, but he isn't saying anything. Jacket drifts back to sleep, but resolves to find the man in the rat mask 
and make him pay for killing the girl. A short time later, Jacket rises from his bed and escapes from the hospital. He returns to his apartment to see it still taped off. He tears through the tape and enters the apartment to see it in ruins. The beds have been stripped and furniture is missing, possibly stolen. In the bathroom, the chalk outline of the girl is still on the floor. Jacket changes into his clothes and sets out to get his revenge. He fights his way through the police station, eventually finding Richter in his cell. When he enters, Richter is amazed to see him. Richter apologizes for killing the girl and tells Jacket he doesn't have any answers for him. Jacket thinks he's hiding something, so he beats the man, throwing him to the floor. Bloodied, the man mumbles that he and Jacket may not be all that different, then asks Jacket if he's been getting strange phone calls. Hinting to Jacket, he was sent to attack him at the behest of the callers. He suggests checking the police files to see if they have any more information on the case, then considers begging for his life. But he knows Jacket is here for revenge, and so accepts whatever fate awaits him. Jacket stands over Richter and begins strangling him, intending to kill him to get revenge for the girl. He picks up the police file about the calls and leaves the station. He returns to his apartment and overnight studies the case file which reveals some interesting information. It details that the suspects were instructed to kill by messages on their phone, and when the police traced the calls, they were traced to a club with ties to the Russian Mafia. Now this was due to the system 50 Blessings had installed at the phone home headquarters, and was not the true source of the calls. However, Jacket believes it to be true, and concludes the Russian Mafia were the ones making the calls, and in particular, made the call to Richter to attack him and kill girlfriend. He also remembers the pain caused by Beard's death, a death induced by the bombing of San Francisco by the Soviet Union. In order to get revenge for his loved ones, Jacket resolves to destroy the rest of the Russian Mafia. He begins by heading to the club in the police report and fights his way to the manager's office. The manager tries to bribe Jacket, but he realizes Jacket's not here for money. He quickly gives up the address to his boss, Father, the leader of the Russian Mafia. He begs for his life, but Jacket isn't in the mood for mercy, and beats the man to death with his bare hands. Jacket then goes to the address given to him by the manager to find it's a lavish villa. He makes his way to the top floor where he meets Father, the leader of the Russian Mafia. After a short conversation, Jacket fights off and kills two Pink Panthers and the Father's bodyguard, prompting Father to begin shooting at Jacket. Using knives dropped by the bodyguard, Jacket manages to fatally injure Father. Knowing he'll die at the hands of Jacket, Father denies him the satisfaction of revenge by taking his own life. The phone on the desk cuts through the silence of the room. Jacket answers and realizes there's one more person left to kill. He picks up Father's gun and takes the elevator upstairs where he finds an old man in a wheelchair. At first, the man seeks answers, but seeing the gun in Jacket's hands, realizes why he's there. Knowing his time is up, he reflects on the terrible things he's done in his life before echoing the parting words of the man in the rooster mask. Nothing seems to really matter anymore, does it? Jacket then levels a gun at his head and fires, killing the patriarch of the Russian Mafia. He walks out to the balcony, throws his mask away, and lights a cigarette. He pulls something from his pocket. It's a photo of him and Beard from 1985. Believing his revenge to be complete, he looks upon the memento one final time before tossing it from the balcony where it flies off into the neon void. However, Jacket doesn't have true catharsis. Had he ever stopped to question why he was being sent to kill, perhaps he could have found the true source of the calls. But he couldn't resist his violent nature because deep down inside, he loved all the destruction he caused. Just like the colonel said in Hawaii. Jacket's actions from this summer help advance the agenda of 50 blessings, putting into motion events that eventually lead to tragedy. The attacks by mass assailants in the summer of 1989 have devastated the Russian Mafia. 
Their weapon caches have been raided, their drug dens destroyed, their political connections assassinated, and now, after the death of father, it sits leaderless. Its gutted criminal empire crumbles, and much of the former territory and operations held by the Russians fall into the hands of the Colombian cartel. Although there are some survivors from the 1989 killings, for all intents and purposes, the Russian Mafia is dead. The man responsible, Jacket, is arrested by the police shortly after the conclusion of his rampage. Suspected to be the ringleaders of the mass vigilantes, he's imprisoned and awaits the trial of his crimes. On July 20th, 1990, Jacket speaks to his lawyer about his upcoming trial. Sitting close by is a familiar face. It's Richter, who was last seen meeting his end at the hands of Jacket. His survival indicates Jacket chose to spare him. It's unclear why, but perhaps it's because he felt a bond with Richter, who was also manipulated by the callers to pursue their ends. Richter is meeting with two men that he doesn't recognize, but it's the janitors behind the phone calls by 50 Blessings, seen by Jacket on May 13th and found by Biker on May 24th. They tell Richter they're here to tie up some loose ends. Richter doesn't understand, but the men say their goodbyes, telling Richter he served them well. They walk off, and confused, Richter leaves to eat. However, the guards instead push him out to the yard, where a large man with a 50 Blessings logo tattooed on his neck attacks him. Using a pipe thrown in the yard, Richter manages to kill the man and exits the yard where he finds the prison is experiencing a massive riot. During the chaos and confusion, Richter changes into a guard's outfit, where he's mistaken as one of the prison staff. He's evacuated as order is restored in the prison, and shortly afterwards, makes his escape. During the chaos of the riot, Jacket didn't participate in the fighting, nor try to escape, indicating he has given up his fight, believing it to be over. In the months that follow, news arises that the Russo-American coalition was conspiring with the Russian Mafia, upsetting the populace of America, raising anti-Russian sentiments even further. Anti-Russian protests begin erupting across the U.S., some of which turn violent. Jacket's trial is highly publicized, and a Hollywood director, Reuven Blankenfeld, capitalizes on the highly publicized trial by making a movie inspired from the murders of 1989. However, some details have been changed. Instead of wearing his signature Letterman jacket and rooster mask, the main character is portrayed as a large, unkempt man that wears a pig mask and is named the Pig Butcher. The phone calls are hallucinations imagined up by the Pig Butcher instead of being real calls. The relationship between the girl and the butcher is negative instead of the loving relationship that emerges between Jacket and the girl. And instead of killing Russians, he's killing teenagers. The actor cast as the Pig Butcher is Martin Brown who is interested in the role since it differs from his typical castings. The movie and Martin himself have received criticism for the movie's glorification of violence. But Martin still goes on interviews to promote the movie, and production on the project continues. One day, while resting, Martin has a dream of a recent interview he had. However, things take a dark turn when Martin expresses violent desires about mutilating people, seemingly revealing a sadistic desire of his. The host gives him uncomfortable glances, which angers Martin, and he stands, pulling a hammer from his coat. Based on the host's reaction, Martin realizes he's dreaming, and suddenly, a man from the crowd stands and puts on a rooster mask. There's a flash of white and the entire room changes. The audience and camera crew disappear. The host has been killed, and her head is sitting displayed on the table. And Martin is now bloody and wearing the pig mask. The man in the rooster mask begins speaking, and tells Martin to wake up, since he thinks he's dreaming. He then asks Martin if he knows how Midnight Animal ends. Martin answers with silence. The man in the mask tells him there's a big twist at the end, one he won't like, adding that no one will. He suggests Martin get out before it's too late. Martin declines the man's recommendation, which prompts the man to simply ask, you really enjoy hurting other people, don't you? Martin tries to explain away his sadistic desires, saying it's just a movie. But the man in the rooster mask knows the truth. A flash of static causes Martin to wake from his dream. 
He continues his work on Midnight Animal, and the day comes where the production films the attack on the police station. The script calls for the pig butcher to fight his way to the interrogation room, where he assaults the girl. Everything proceeds as normal, but when the butcher enters the room during the shoot, the girl grabs a nearby gun and shoots him. She stands over him, screams she's not his girlfriend, and fires several more rounds into the butcher, finishing with a round to the head. The director yells cut and pours praise upon his actors for the scene. Apparently, the script was updated to this new scene. The director tells his actors to get something to eat while they set up the next shot. However, Martin doesn't move. As he lays on the ground bleeding, it becomes clear there was a prop mistake. Martin was shot with live rounds, and he dies on the set of the Midnight Animal movie. On October 25th, 1991, after reading the paper about Jacket's trial, a man finishes using the bathroom. This man is named Manny Pardo, and he forgoes his meal at the diner, telling the waitress he's had a rough night so he's going to go home to get some sleep. However, on the way home, he stops by a local store and kills all of the people inside. The chaos draws the police, and they confront Pardo when he exits the building. They order him to the ground, but Pardo flashes a badge and reveals he's a detective. After explaining the situation to the officer, he leaves, mumbling that sometimes he hates this city. Before heading home, he goes to an apartment building where a murder has recently taken place. The victim has had his throat slit, and a message has been written in his blood. Pardo approaches the officer in charge, who tells him he's got a serial killer on his hands, explaining this murder fits the M.O. from previous ones. When he mocks the contents of the message, it prompts Pardo to guess the killer is insane. He guesses the press should be happy with the story, and there's a strange flash of white where a camera crew appears, but quickly vanishes. The officer doubts the media will care about the murder since it isn't gory enough, a thought which unsettles him. Pardo isn't bothered by the thought though, saying he was born with thick skin. The officer tells him they haven't found any clues, but the CSI team is still investigating the scene, so he'll let Pardo know if anything turns up, and Pardo tells him to head to the station to get started on the paperwork. Halloween is a few days later, and a local hangout hosts a Halloween party. Amongst the partygoers are a group of friends. Alex, Mark, Ash, Tony, and Corey. The friendship between these characters stretches all the way back to 1985 in the Russo-American War, where they were seen sitting in the same bar as the Ghost Wolves. As members of D Company, they became fans of Jacket after seeing him and the Ghost Wolves single-handedly take the stronghold they were having so much trouble capturing. Seeing his rise to infamy following the conclusion of the Mass Maniac killings in 1989, filled them with envy, so they decide to try and replicate his events from 1989 in an effort to achieve infamy of their own. Because of their idolization of Jacket, these characters are nicknamed the Fans. They select animal masks of their own to use, and convert one of their local hangouts into a base for themselves, where they set up phones in the vain hope they'll get a phone call, just like Jacket. However, 50 Blessings stopped the calls in 1989 after Jacket killed the leader of the Russian Mafia, so of course the fans have never received a call. On Halloween, the fans are at the party in their hangout in their chosen animal masks. They aren't having a good time, however, so Mark asks if tonight is going to be the night that they do it, referring to the first time they would be going out to kill. Sick of waiting for a phone call, Tony and Ash enthusiastically agree and the fans set out in their van. They attack a group of miscreants in an electronics shop and kill all of them. Afterwards, they celebrate their first kill by getting pizza. Jacket's trial is still ongoing, and on November 5th, the court is deliberating the veracity of his claims of phone calls. The police chief reveals to the prosecutor that no physical evidence of the calls was found, as the tape in Jacket's answering machine had been removed. He then tells the defense that phone records indicate Jacket received calls in the time frames he suggests, and when traced, indicated they originated from a nightclub called the Golden Truck Stop, which has been linked to the Russian Mafia in the past, seeming to corroborate the defense's claim that Jacket was coerced by the Russian Mafia into committing the crimes with which he is being charged. Listening to the testimony is a writer named Evan Wright who's the same man that took the picture of Beard and Jacket way back in 1985. 
He's quit his job as a reporter and is now trying to unravel the mysteries of the 1989 killings to publish a book about the truth. Listening to the testimony, he comes up with an interesting question. Why would the Russian Mafia charge Jacket with killing their own members? He determines that he needs to talk to someone in the Russian Mafia and has an idea of someone that might have a connection. He runs to a payphone and calls the Miami Police Department where he's connected with Detective Pardo and asks if he knows anyone he could talk to. Pardo initially refuses, but Evan mentions he owes him a vague favor and Pardo gives in, giving him an address and telling him to ask for someone named Petrov. Evan thanks Pardo and exits the courthouse to catch a cab. A crowd is gathered outside to protest Jacket's trial, which Alex and Ash are present at. Evan also notices a strange man standing amongst the protesters, a man with blue hair wearing a neon pink jacket. Evan hops in his cab and heads to the address given to him by Pardo. Outside, he finds a Russian gangster guarding the door. Evan asks to speak to Petrov, but the guard rebuffs his attempts to get inside. In a fit of desperate rage, Evan beats the man to death. He's instantly regrettable and rushes inside asking for someone to call an ambulance. However, the gangsters inside only try to kill him. Attempting to avoid further bloodshed, Evan incapacitates his attackers and dismantles their guns. However, if he's pushed too far, he forgoes his caution and begins slaughtering the gangsters. Either way, he makes his way to a sauna on the second floor and finds Petrov. He tells Petrov that he's writing a book about the mass maniac killings and was hoping he would answer a few questions. Impressed that Evan would risk his life for a scoop, he agrees to answer two questions. Evan first asks if Petrov agrees with the police's claims that the murderers were part of a vigilante movement. Petrov says he doesn't believe that they were vigilantes because they were way too organized. Evan then asks why he thinks murderers were targeting the Russian Mafia specifically. Petrov doesn't have an answer, but mentions they destroyed their organization and then disappeared, hinting it was a goal they were working towards. He comments that they were well trained and any vigilante they caught never broke to torture and interrogation. He then ends the interview, kicking Evan out of the building. Afterwards, Evan meets with Detective Pardo to get a drink. Evan tells Pardo about his day, and Pardo is surprised to hear Evan went to the address. Evan is upset with Pardo for sending him into danger, and Pardo condescendingly says to Evan to write about the Miami Mutilator instead, saying it's a much more sophisticated case. He adds that most people have forgotten about the mass maniacs by the time his book's out anyways. He tries to call them even, saying he bought Evan a beer, but Evan refuses, saying Pardo still owes him a favor. Pardo reluctantly agrees and reminds Evan he's risking his job giving Evan his leads. Evan replies that he's surprised Pardo hasn't been fired already, hinting he knows of some misconduct by Pardo, but willingly turns a blind eye to it. Evan says he's feeling tired and Pardo says he's gonna get some sleep too, so the two then leave the bar. About a week later on November 11th, Evan is alone in his home. The crib in the master bedroom and the adjacent bedroom filled with children's toys shows Evan has a family, and his wife lovingly cooked him breakfast and left it for him on the table. Evan doesn't eat and instead reads the paper to hear the Miami mutilator has claimed a fifth victim. Then notices he has a message on his answering machine. When he checks it, the person on the other end says they saw his ad in the paper and is willing to give information about the mass maniac killings in exchange for $200. The stranger says he'll be at Hank's all day and Evan sets out, but he has another meeting to get to first. He hops on the subway and a homeless man approaches and asks for money. Evan uncomfortably offers some, but there's a sudden crack of lightning and the man puts on a rooster mask, refusing Evan's dirty money. Evan is confused and the man removes his mask to reveal Evan's wife Sharon underneath. She chastises him for freely handing out money and suggests he quit trying to be a writer and get a real job again, reminding him they have kids to feed. Still confused, Evan asks what's going on and Sharon threatens to take the kids and leave him. Evan tries to reassure her, saying this book will change things for the better, but he just needs more time. This conversation between Evan and Sharon contrasts with the loving dynamic shown in their home, revealing Evan's pursuit of the truth will destroy his family, yet Evan believes the book will save it. 
Sharon puts on the rooster mask and the man returns, warning Evan that he has no time left and suggests he reconsiders his priorities. Evan asks him to clarify and a flash of white reveals a homeless man in front of him who storms off again refusing his money. He gets off at his stop and fights off hooligans that have claimed the stop as their territory. He catches a quick bus ride and gets off at a familiar stop. He enters a nearby home to find Rosa Berg sitting in her living room. Evan has some questions about her son Richter, who was identified as one of the masked maniacs from 1989. Rosa says she doesn't know how he got involved and he wouldn't reveal anything when she visited him in prison. She noticed he was behaving differently going to see old friends she did know he had. She was happy he was going out since she always felt guilty about holding him back since he took care of her. Evan asks if Richter has been in contact since his escape, and Rosa coyly says she can't talk about that. So Rosa says that if he's in contact, she'll give Richter Evan's number and leave it up to him if he'd like to call. Evan thanks her, then asks if he can take a look around. He makes his way up to Richter's old room, where on the desk, he finds cassette tapes dated to March of 1989. This is exactly what Evan needed, physical evidence of the calls made to the vigilantes. He takes the tapes and leaves. Before heading home, he stops by Hanks and finds the blue haired man from outside the courthouse sitting at the bar. Biker has returned to Miami, but he's not the same man that fled all those years ago. He has disheveled hair and an unkempt beard, and his bloodshot eyes imply he's been sitting here all day drinking. A large scar scratches across his face, implying his fight with Jacket and phone home didn't end as well as he remembers. Evan sits down, and Biker attempts to tell him his story, about killing Russian gangsters, about signing up for 50 blessings, which he only remembers as patriotic bullshit, and about the weird phone calls but is frequently interrupted by Evan, who isn't understanding him. Biker reveals he found out who was behind it all, but doesn't remember discovering the janitor's plan, only remembering there was something big behind it all. When he realized that, he went into hiding, and that's where he met him. After this terrifying encounter, he lost the will to fight, and he's cowered in the desert since then. Evan asks who he thinks were making the phone calls, and Biker doesn't have an answer, implying he's either forgotten the truth in his downward spiral of alcoholism, or never hacked the janitor's computer and found the truth. He then asks Evan for his reward money, mumbling he needs another drink. Here, Evan has the truth in front of him, but given Biker's state, Evan thinks he's listening to the ramblings of a drunkard, and refuses to believe his story. Evan tells Biker he can't pay him unless he gives some more substantial information. Seeing Evan isn't willing to pay, Biker tells Evan to leave. Even though Evan had talked to the one person that could have led him to the truth, the factors at play prevent Evan from believing Biker's story, and he leaves the bar without gaining some valuable information about the full story behind the mass murders. On November 18th, we find the new head of the Russian Mafia, Sun, in his office. After inheriting his father's criminal empire, he watched it crumble around him, and seeing it lie in the hands of the Colombians fills him with rage. He desires to restore the prestige of the Russian Mafia, and begins developing a new drug encased in a green and purple pill to re-establish their presence in the drug trade, but knows he needs to do more to gain ground against the Colombians. He calls his most loyal henchmen into his office and announces they'll be attacking the strip club the Colombians just opened, thus starting a gang war. The henchman is hesitant about the idea, but Sun's anger at being robbed by the Colombians can't be quelled, and he explains they need to strike now because if they keep waiting, the Colombians will just keep expanding. He ends the debate, and the henchman says he'll follow Sun's orders, so the two set out to the newly opened strip club and kill all the Colombians at the party. Afterwards, they return to Sun's office, where Sun is lavishly surrounded by women with drugs and money prominently displayed on the table in front of him. He wants to celebrate, but the henchman isn't as excited to party. He says that he's going to head home to his girlfriend instead, and Sun realizes why the henchman was unwilling to start the war with the Colombians. He's let himself get attached to this girlfriend of his, 
and now he's reluctant to continue his work in the Mafia. He tries telling his friend that he doesn't need a woman to live his life, that once he gets attached to someone, that'll be it for him, then warns that this girlfriend is too good for him, and one day, she'll realize it. He sits in silence for a moment, then tells the henchman he can leave if that's what he wants, but gives him some money before he goes, telling him to get his girlfriend something nice. The henchman takes the handout and heads home in his plane fiat. On November 21st, the henchman approaches his son, where he tells him he wants out of the Russian Mafia. He explains that he's feeling too soft, too soft for killing people and risking his life all the time. It's a feeling he's had for a while, mentioning strange dreams he's been having. Son says if he wants out, he's out, but first asks him to take care of a chop shop that is defected to the Colombians. Once that's done, he's out, but tells the henchman that he always has a home with the Mafia if he changes his mind, and offers a sample of the new Russian product which has finished production. The henchman takes the pills and heads to the chop shop, where he pulls his gun out for what he hopes is the last time and clears out the traitors. In the back, he finds one of the hoodlums stuffing money in a duffel bag, likely readying a payment to the Colombians. He knows he should bring the money to Sun, but seeing so much money before him fills him with greed. Envious of a rich lifestyle, he rationalizes that he doesn't answer to Sun anymore and claims the money bag for himself. When he leaves, he finds a young man that escaped the bloodbath inside. Instead of killing this last hoodlum, he lets him escape, saying the bag of money just saved his life. He gets in his car and leaves. He returns home where his girlfriend Mary greets him at the door. He tells her that he quit his job and that he has a surprise for her, but he's tired right now so he'll show her tomorrow. He heads off to bed, sliding the bag of money underneath. That night, the henchman has one of the strange dreams he mentioned earlier. He's speeding down an interstate, blaring the radio of a new fancy car with his money bag in the back seat, when the radio warns of an impending storm due to hit Miami. Suddenly, there's a flash of light, and the henchman's money disappears in the back seat, replaced by what looks to be sun, except he's wearing a rooster mask. He asks where they're going, and the henchman replies that he's going far away. It doesn't matter where. The man asks if he's sure, saying that without directions, a lot of people end up going in circles, ending up back where they started. He adds that this road doesn't look promising, hinting that the henchman's recent decision to pursue material wealth put him on the same road as staying in the Russian Mafia. The henchman replies that he didn't ask him, and the man wonders if the henchman would want to know if the road he's on doesn't lead to where he wants but to a dead end, warning that he's closing in on it fast, but hints that it's something the henchman already knows. The henchman claims ignorance, and the man simply says he'll see soon enough, then notices something is missing. Smugly, he turns to the henchman and asks him, did you forget to bring your girlfriend? The henchman suddenly wakes up from his nightmare. However, the masked man's words have uneased him, and he checks under the bed to find the money bag missing. He calls for Mary, who he finds is also missing. In the kitchen, he finds an apology note from her saying he'd do the same thing, which, if his dream is any indication, is right. He exits his house to find his car missing. Son was right. Mary took the money and left the henchman behind. Crushed by Mary's betrayal, the henchman tries to get over his grief by getting high on the new Russian product at a local bar. He tries calling her, but Miss dials and throws the phone against the wall in frustration. Suddenly, the fan's van screeches to a halt outside the bar. They're here for the henchman, having been sent by Andy, the young man the henchman left alive after clearing out the chop shop. After killing everyone else, they enter the henchman's room. While the henchman rambles erratically in his high, the fans pull him from the couch, and one of them smacks him in the head with a pipe. Numb to the pain, the henchman continues rambling, until finally saying he wants to go home. That's all he wants to do, is go home. He is then beaten to death by the fans. Nearly a week later, on November 27th, Evan cashes in his favor to Pardo. He convinces him to let him into the police evidence locker to search the belongings of the 50 Blessings operative, Jake. 
Hoping to find something that would lead him to the truth, Eben finds nothing among the man's belongings. Pardo apologizes that his search was fruitless, but says that they're even now, to which Eben reluctantly agrees. That night, Eben dreams that there was a floppy disk among Jake's belongings, obtained from the desk of someone affiliated with the phone calls. Pardo informs him it contained addresses associated to the vigilantes, and Evan convinces him to let him borrow it. He gets the list printed, and heads to one of the addresses to find a large abandoned building with a strange design. The front door is a heavy vault door, and the walls seem to be made of a thick metal. The inside also houses some oddities. There's a large room of bunk beds, a water reclaimer, and even a gymnasium. It seems like the building was constructed as a sort of makeshift bunker. Evan finds a banner that indicates this building used to house an organization named 50 Blessings. And indeed, this is the very building Jake visited before his death in 1989. In the back, Evan finds a strange sight. There are a number of people with rubber animal masks all sitting around a red symbol painted on the floor. A circle with three lines running through it. Here, Evan has another chance to realize the truth, that the masked maniacs were used by 50 blessings to assassinate members of the Russian Mafia and topple the Russo-American coalition. However, the dialogue with the masked individuals shows that Evan still doesn't see the whole picture, and his conversation with them seems to hint that Evan doesn't want to know, preferring to leave the truth in the dark. Evan is then scared out of the building back to his home symbolizing he's more concerned with fixing his family than finding the truth behind the murders. December 2nd marks the return of the fans who are hanging out in their hideout. Ash tells the others about a place his friend Jack told them about, and mentions that Jack wants them to rescue his sister. Tony's annoyed at the favor, saying he didn't start doing this to become a hero. Ash argues that's what they did last time and he didn't hear any complaining then, then says they can't just patrol the streets or they'd be quickly arrested. Tony reluctantly agrees, and the fans set out to the address and kill all the junkies within. They find Jack's sister locked in a closet, and they tell her to come with them, but she refuses, so the fans leave without her. This will create an unintended consequence for the fans. On their way back, the van breaks down, and Ash is forced to do emergency repairs. While Tony gripes at him, Ash tells him to take the van down to Andy at the chop shop, since he owes them a favor for killing the Russian henchman. He gets a temporary fix in place, and the fans head back. On December 7th, the newspapers talk about the violent drug war that has erupted between the Russians and the Colombians. So far, the Russians have been able to maintain their ground against the Colombians. Now, Sun has a new plan. He gathers some men for an upcoming attack, and, confident in their success, toasts their status as new kings of the street. The Russians set out and attack a bank controlled by the Colombians, in order to destroy their finances. After disabling some security, Sun makes his way to the vault where he finds one of his men dead among the money and gold. In the back of the vault are some ghostly figures. His grandfather, the bodyguard, and his father. In wide-eyed amazement, Sun asks his father what they're doing here. His father simply answers that he's not here, and that Sun knows that. His father then asks what he's doing here, Son can only answer that he wants to make father proud. Father says that doesn't matter, then mentions that son hasn't changed and is just like him, vaguely mentioning he won't understand until it's too late. The bodyguard then puts a rooster mask on grandfather and there's a bright flash of white. His grandfather begins speaking, but strangely, the voice he hears isn't his grandfather's voice. It's almost as if someone else is speaking. They reiterate what father said, then add that it doesn't matter since it's all the same in the end, and there's nothing son can do about it. Son tries reaching out to his father again, but the man in the rooster mask cuts him off, saying he's not here anymore, and neither is son. The scene abruptly fades to black. After Martin Brown's death on the set of Midnight Animal, Production continued and eventually the project was completed and released. The film was controversial even upon its release and a newspaper read by Mark on December 9th details a controversy. The outcome of the fans' previous mission created some unintended consequences for them. 
leaving Jack's sister alive, left a witness to their crimes, and she goes to the police to report the massacre of her friends. The story of the new mass vigilantes is taken up by the media, and every news outlet in Miami is featuring the story. The fans are finally getting some notoriety, and Mark meets with the others to discuss the news story that ran on Channel 6 that featured them. Desiring to increase their fame further, the fans clear out a drug den found by Alex. The fans discover the gangster's den extends into the sewers below the building as well, and while clearing out this section, they come across a grisly scene. The gangsters have set up a torture chamber and are dissolving corpses in acid, dumping the remains down the drain. After clearing out the gangsters, the fans flee the scene. The next morning, while reading the paper about their exploits, Alex hears a knock on her door, and she hears it's the police. She asks for a moment to get dressed and heads to her bedroom where she hides her swan costume under the bed and changes. She goes back to the door to find the man outside has already entered her home and is kneeling in her kitchen. It's Detective Pardo, and when she confronts him, he says he entered because the door wasn't locked. He then asks for Ash, but Alex curtly says he's not here. Pardo tells her to have him call the Miami Police Department if she sees him, and leaves shortly after. Strangely, he seems to have dropped and forgotten his wallet in Alex's kitchen, and additionally, he seems to have arrested a suspect, but instead of transporting him in the back of his car, he's got him trapped in his trunk. He leaves Alex's house and heads to the docks where his trunk is now empty, indicating he must have dropped off the suspect. Nearby, the Colombian cartel has an operation that uses some of the ports for their organization. However, their war with the Russians has weakened them, and now the police are preparing to raid the docks to put a stop to the Colombians' operations. But Pardo takes matters into his own hands and single-handedly attacks and destroys the Colombian operation, weakening them even further. Afterwards, Pardo is reprimanded by another officer who claims he put the entire police raid in danger, but Pardo, in no mood for criticism, tells the officer to complain to the chief. He leaves and arrives at a nearby warehouse where another victim of the Miami Mutilator has been found. Although this crime has the hallmarks of the Miami Mutilator, the mutilation, and the message written in blood, talking with the officer reveals this killing is different from the others. There were cuff marks around the victim's wrists and ankles, implying he was brought here by force, and he was strangled to death, so the mutilation happened post-mortem. Additionally, the officer mentions the victim's wallet was missing. Strangely, Pardo left the wallet in Alex's house, and outside in the trunk of his car was a man bound and gagged whose appearance is pretty similar to the man that was found later killed by the Miami Mutilator. Maybe the rugged Detective Pardo isn't as noble as he seems. The destruction of the Colombians' operation of the docks gives the Russian Mafia an advantage in their gang war, something Pardo is aware of. So a few days later, on December 14th, he pays a visit to Sun's headquarters. However, he's rebuffed by the receptionist who claims Sun isn't in, so Pardo leaves with a warning that he'll be coming for him soon enough. Sun is in the building and unconcerned with the threats of the police, as he's thought of a plan to end the war between the Russians and the Colombians, and reclaim the prestige of the Russian Mafia. He attacks the Colombians' headquarters alone, fighting his way to the office of the head of the cartel. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Colombian leader tells him to surrender, but Sun claims he has the upper hand. He gives the Colombians 10 seconds to surrender, and as he begins counting, his men creep up to the windows bordering the office. Upon reaching 10, his men open fire, killing everyone in the office, eliminating the Colombians and re-establishing the Russians as the kings of the street. A few days later, Evan is working alone in his study. The past few weeks have not been kind to him. Half of the master bed and the crib is stripped, and the child's room is empty with that bed stripped as well. Sharon made good on her threat. She really took the kids and left Evan. All he has left is the book. While working, he hears the phone ring, and when he answers, Richter is on the other line. Richter says he'd be willing to tell Evan his story, but he asks for a plane ticket in return. Evan agrees to the deal, but only if Richter's story is any good. 
He tells him to start at the beginning so he can get the full picture. And Richter tells him all that's happened to him. His mother, the phone calls, the painted marks, the murders, his arrest, and his escape. It's exactly what Evan needed to finish his book. And he fills his house with notes on Richter's story. Richter says that after his escape, he made it to Hawaii and reveals the plane ticket isn't for him, but for his mother. He's concerned about her and wants to take care of her to make sure she's okay. Evan says he'll do what he needs to to get her there and thanks Richter saying he's been a tremendous help. Thanks to Richter's testimony, Evan finally has what he needs to find the truth behind the killings and finish his book. As he processes all the information Richter just shared with him, he notices a letter scattered among the notes on his table. It's from his wife, Sharon. She wants to reconcile their relationship but says she can't be with someone that places his work before his family. She ends the letter by saying she loves him and asks him to call her when he reads this. Evan finally understands what the man in the rooster mask was hinting at. Evan can't have the best of both worlds and will have to sacrifice one of either his family or his book in order to keep the other. He stands in his home with a serious choice to make. Will he walk to his typewriter to continue working on his book and sacrifice his family? Or will he call his wife and reconcile with his family, thereby sacrificing all the blood, sweat, and tears he's given for this book? On December 20th, Mark enters the fans hideout with new masks for them to try on. They're rooster masks, and when the fans try them on, Mark asks how they feel. But it's strange. To Mark, it's as if the mask itself answers, but all it talks about is a roof. A phone rings, and a flash of white reveals Mark had been hallucinating. Alex rushes over to the phones to answer the call, but none of those phones are ringing. Ash reveals he stole the cell phone of the Russian bodyguard from November, and now it's ringing. When he answers, someone with a Russian accent is on the other end and invites him to a party he's having at his new place, and gives him an address. The person on the other line is Sun, who is celebrating with his men after conquering the Colombian cartel. He doesn't know about the henchman's death, and wanting to see his friend again, tries to invite him to the party. Ash doesn't say anything, and thinking the henchman is refusing his offer, Sun throws his phone across the room in anger. He takes handfuls of the new Russian product to swallow his disappointment. However, this is exactly what the fans have been waiting for, a phone call directing them to an address to kill the Russians that reside there. Ash excitedly rushes everyone to the van, saying he'll explain on the way. The fans arrive at the address and Corey insists on a stakeout, and the fans discover the building houses the remnants of the Russian Mafia. Ash hacks the door lock open, and the excited fans pour in, with the exception of Mark. He has reservations about their escape plan using the roof, likely due to his unsettling hallucination with the rooster masks earlier. Tony reassures Mark that they'll be able to escape using the roof, so Mark follows him inside. Each of the fans easily clears a floor of the Russian mobsters, but afterwards encounter something they didn't expect. Alex and Ash get to the roof, but they don't find anyone else there, and no one is answering their radios. Unknown to them, the rest of their friends have met their end at the hands of Sun. After taking handfuls of the Russian product, Sun got insanely high and began hallucinating, seeing his own men as demons. While he wandered around his headquarters, slaughtering his own men, he encounters the fans, whom he sees as monstrous representatives of their animal masks. Mark is a large bear that he beats to death with a club. Cory is a zebra that is ironically shot. Tony is a massive tiger that shot with a shotgun and Alex and Ash appear to him as a giant twin-headed swan. When he makes his appearance to Alex and Ash, however, he instantly shoots Ash in the head. He lets out a maniacal laugh, and as Alex screams at him, he shoots her as well. In his high, Sun finds a golden gate with a rainbow bridge behind it. He steps onto the bridge and is eventually engulfed in the neon void. His drug-filled mind suddenly gives him a moment of enlightenment and he understands what Father's ghost was saying in the bank vault. It was an echo of Grandfather's dying sentiment. Death is an inevitability, meaning nothing we do in life matters 
since it all gets wiped away when we die. Inside the headquarters, the police have arrived and begin rounding up the survivors. Detective Pardo also shows up, and when he finds they've trapped a suspect in a room, he pulls rank on the leading officer to talk to him. It's Tony. He survived Sun's attack and has collected the bodies of Corey and Mark, where he mourns their deaths while waiting to be arrested by the SWAT team. When Pardo enters, he pulls his revolver while Tony immediately surrenders. However, since Tony is still wearing his mask, Pardo concludes he's giving up just so he can revel in the small amount of fame the fans have gained. He rejects Tony's surrender and murders him in cold blood, dashing any chance at fame that Tony could have had. He exits the room and lies to the others saying he had to kill Tony because he tried attacking him. As he leaves the building, he passes by a body smeared on the concrete outside. It's the splattered remains of Sun. In his high, he walked off the edge of the building and fell to his death. And with his death, so too dies a resurgence of the Russian Mafia. A few days later, Pardo arrives at another Miami Mutilator crime scene, but this one is much more gruesome. Limbs have been cut off from the body, and the victim has been mutilated beyond recognition. Pardo talks to the leading officer who reveals a shell casing was found, along with some prints, and mentions they might find more when they do a more thorough sweep of the apartment. Pardo thinks his murder is going to get a lot of press, so he hopes they find more because the chief is going to be all over him. Pardo even thinks his job's on the line. Not wanting to get in the way of the investigation, he tells the officer he's tired, so he's going to head home. At his apartment, he reads the paper which reveals anti-Russian protests have intensified due to an upcoming Russo-American coalition conference, and shortly after, heads to bed. He wakes later that night in a panic. He's lost something and turned his apartment inside out looking for it. He then leaves his apartment and returns to the Miami Mutilator crime scene from earlier where he finds his gun lying on a table and sitting next to it is a stranger. When Pardo approaches, he finds the man has a face like a puppet. Pardo asks what the man is doing there and the puppet simply says that murderers always return to the scene of the crime, vaguely hinting at a dark secret. Pardo asks who he is, and the man reveals that they're related, by blood in fact, and Pardo can think of him as his son, since he created the puppet. Pardo demands his gun back, but the puppet offers a hug instead, and begins choking Pardo. During this struggle, the dark truth is revealed. Pardo is the Miami mutilator, and the puppet is the murderous entity within him that forces him to commit the Miami mutilator killings. He pushes the puppet off, and as its head shatters on the floor, Pardo realizes that his time has come to an end. At his most recent killing, he left behind physical evidence, bullet casings that can be tracked to his gun, and minor fingerprints that the police will be able to match to him. He worries they will be able to determine that his reckless attack on the Colombians and his murder of the last surviving member of the new mass vigilantes were an effort by him to remove other headlining stories from the paper so the Miami Mutilator story could get the attention he believed it deserved, and fears they'll interview his friend Evan Wright, who might know more of Pardo's transgressions, and provide them with further evidence. He begins to fantasize about what'll happen to him, and it plays out in his head like a movie. The chief will order Pardo to confess and turn himself in, but Pardo will claim innocence and attempt to fight his way out of the station in the hopes to exonerate himself. However, he will not be able to escape his fate, symbolized by being gunned down by the police. Static interrupts the scene, indicating Pardo is dreaming. He awakens to hear his phone ringing. When he answers, it's the station on the other line. They call him into work, saying they have a situation. Pardo, suspecting they've determined the truth, explains that he doesn't feel good today, so he's going to stay home. The caller begins to protest, but Pardo hangs up on him. Intending to have a last stand, Pardo barricades his door, gets drunk, and aims his revolver at the door, waiting for the police assault. However, the station was calling him in for a completely different issue. It's now December 28th. Evan came through and got Rosa a ticket so she could reunite with her son. 
Richter and his mother now sit together on a beach in Hawaii watching TV. Depending on Evan's choice earlier, they may be watching an interview with him about his book, or a posthumous airing of an interview with Martin Brown. However, the interview is interrupted by an emergency broadcast, which announces the President of the United States has been assassinated. It continues, saying the Russo-American Coalition Conference was interrupted by a league of armed men led by what seems to be a U.S. Army general. The men appear to be staging a coup d'etat, and the Russian president was also killed in the chaos. This is the culmination of the work of the janitors, the colonel, and the 50 Blessings organization. They've managed to seize control of the U.S. government and now stand opposed to Russia. The broadcast finishes by warning that Russia will view the assassination as an act of war, and the repercussions could be severe. Richter turns off the TV and his mother grabs a rooster mask from her bag. There's a flash of white, and the man in the rooster mask returns. He remarks that Richter's made himself comfortable, then asks if he knows the saying about good times. Richter, knowing he isn't speaking to his mother, says that he does. Good times never last. The mask confirms that everything will soon be over. Richter, believing this is about him, asks if the police are onto him. But the mask clarifies what he means, ominously saying this is much worse. Richter asks if he has a lot of time left, and the mask says he doesn't. In fact, no one does. Richter realizes there's nothing he can do, but asks the mask anyways who confirms that there's nothing anybody can do at this point. Standing in contrast to every other character, Richter doesn't try to fight or resist his fate, but calmly accepts it. In his final moments, the mask comforts Richter, saying, Leaving this world isn't as scary as it sounds. At that point, a bright explosion washes over the screen, killing Richter and his mother. The result of a nuclear strike by Russia in response to the assassination of its president and the bloody coup of the government of America perpetuated by 50 blessings. If the construction of their former headquarters was any indication, it's a result 50 blessings was prepared for. As the credits roll, the surviving members of Hotline Miami are all killed in similar explosions, indicating other regions of America were struck by the missiles, likely destroying the country and ending the Hotline Miami series. And that comprises the entirety of Hotline Miami. Now, I'm not perfect. There may be some errors in there. Martin's sequences aren't dated at all, neither is Eben and Richter's conversation, and there are some instances where characters' perspectives could be called into question. But I believe this accurately places the events of Hotline Miami in a chronology and tells the story in its entirety. Like I said before, if you would like a more focused telling of a particular character's story, there's an entire playlist on the channel where each character has their own story told in a more condensed video. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Until next time, thank you for watching and see you later. Beard's Death Richter's Coerced Murders Jake's Betrayal The characters of Hotline Miami are constantly surrounded by tragedy. 